Today's podcast is somewhat of an experiment. It's a new format that we are going to be considering doing more of, and that is a deep dive into mitzvahs. As you know, we have a mitzvah podcast, and if you're not a subscriber, go subscribe right now. But in the mitzvah podcast, we try to survey, try to explore a given mitzvah, to gain a basic literacy in every mitzvah, to understand the contours of every mitzvah, to get like a snapshot of every mitzvah. What you're about to hear right now is a deep dive into a mitzvah. Not just exploring it, not just, you know, seeing the various angles of it, but fundamentally studying it from all kinds of dimensions and all kinds of angles and really trying to get a fundamental understanding of that mitzvah. If you enjoy it, if you want to hear more of this ilk of podcasts, send me an email, rabbiwalbejima.com. I want your feedback on this experiment. Now, the first mitzvah we're going to cover is the mitzvah of mezuzah. Mezuzah is perhaps the most visible mitzvah. Every Jewish home has a mezuzah fixed on its front door, and maybe even some of the internal doors. It's one of the first mitzvahs that our children encounter. We train our children when you pass the mezuzah to touch it, to kiss it. It's one of the first things that we do when we inaugurate a new home, a new establishment. We affix the mezuzah. Typically, there is a decorative case, or at a minimum, there's some sort of casing to house the mezuzah. It's often embellished with the letter shin. If you remove the case, you're going to find that it contains a tightly rolled up scroll, which is handwritten with a special ink, with a special quill by a highly trained scribe. And he writes in it two paragraphs from the Torah, not just any paragraphs, but the first two paragraphs of the Shema from the book of Deuteronomy. The first paragraph is Devarim Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And the second paragraph is Devarim Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 21. Now, both of those paragraphs contain the verse, Utsavtam al You should write these words upon the doorposts of your house and your gates. Now, if you were to examine the contents of those paragraphs, you'll find that they contain some of the most important tenets of our religion. It starts off with the Shema. Believe in God. Believe in one God. And then it talks about to love God, ve'ahavta es Hashem Elokecha, the ideal relationship that we ought to have, we ought to foster with God, is one of love. And that love extends to commitment. We have to love God with all our heart, with all our resources, with all our life. We are committing in this paragraph to even die for God should the opportunity arise. We talk about the paramount importance of Torah study and the imperative to perpetuate the Torah and our glorious traditions to future generations. We read about the mitzvah of tefillin, where we take these same words that appear in the Shema plus other citations, and we bind them not to our door, not to our door post, but to our head, to our brain, and to our heart. And the second paragraph of the Shema, as featured in the mezuzah, talks about the notion of reward and punishment. Our actions, our deeds, our behavior, they all have consequences. We're not here playing around. Our adherence to God's rules and to God's dicta, they carry weight. If we obey our Creator, if we hearken to His words, He is going to provide for us all of our needs. If we make the unfortunate blunder, to repudiate our relationship with God, he's going to be angry at us. And he's going to punish us commensurately by causing famine and exile. It's not a good idea. And finally, we're told that adherence to the laws of God, and specifically to the mezuzah and the tefillin, through that we earn life, long life, stable life for ourselves and our children. 
So the words found in the mezuzah weren't just arbitrarily selected. They contained some of the most iconic verses in the Torah and verses that serve as like our pledge of allegiance to God and words that essentially offer almost like an encapsulation of all that we believe in and all that we stand for. And we take those words and we write it down very carefully following the very specific laws of Rangam Azaza and we wrap it up and we affix it onto our doorposts. And every time you pass it, tens, dozens, scores, hundreds of times a day, you encounter the mezuzah. And our sages tell us that there are manifold benefits of the mezuzah. If you're careful with the mezuzah, it is conducive to a long life for you and your children. Is there anything that we want more than a long, happy, stable, secure life for us and our children? Moreover, it is the Jewish home security system. It prevents destructive forces from entering our home. It banishes death. In Hebrew, the word used in the Torah, al mizuzos, the word mizuzos, our sages tell us, meaning the mezuzah, contain the same letters as zuz mavis, banish death. It's security. The Talmud tells us it is a prophylactic against sin. The Talmud talks about a life that is designed in a way that a person who lives that kind of life will not violate the will of his creator. And part of that is the mezuzah. The Talmud also tells us, if you have a good mezuzah, if you're careful about the mitzvah mezuzah, you're going to have a nice house. And especially in today's crazy housing market with the insane rise in housing prices, who would not want that? So this introduction should be sufficient inspiration to encourage us, to inspire us, to dig a little bit deeper into this mitzvah, to try to plumb the depths of this mitzvah, to understand what it's all about, to understand what are its hidden secrets. What else can we learn about it? How do we unlock the great mystery and great power of this wonderful mitzvah? Over the course of our exploration, our deep dive of this mitzvah, we're going to try to uncover many angles of this fascinating subject. What's the meaning behind it? What is the secret power inherent in it? It's a fascinating subject. So let's begin. A good place to start is by further examining the power of the passages of the Shema as featured in the mezuzah. As we mentioned, the citations featured in the scroll of the mezuzah are the first two paragraphs of the Shema, Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 6, 5 verses, verses 4 through 9, Devarim 11, 9 verses, 13 through 21, a total of, what, 14, 15 verses? And not just any verses, verses that encapsulate the principles of our faith. Words that are inextricably connected to the Jewish heart, to the Jewish soul. I say just tell us, the first words we train our children to utter are the words of the Shema, the same words that are in our mezuzahs. The last words that we utter in our life on this planet, before we pass, we say the Shema. These words are the bookends of our life. First things we say, last things we say. These words are forever etched in the Jewish heart. During the Holocaust, there were many desperate Jewish parents that had no choice other than to take their Jewish children and deposit them in Christian monasteries with the hope that maybe they'll survive the war and maybe they can be reclaimed afterwards. At war's end, often the parents and maybe even all the relatives were gone and there were still many Jewish children in Christian monasteries all over Europe And there was a man, famous rabbi, 
the United States, Rabbi Silver, who entered Christian monasteries with a team of American soldiers and said, where are the Jewish children? Give them to me. And they said, Jewish children? I don't know what you're talking about. They're all Christians. There ain't no Jewish kids over here. And he came back at bedtime and he walked up and down these orphanages, these monasteries, and he said out loud the words of the Shema. And instinctively, all the Jewish kids lifted their right hand and covered their eyes and started crying for their mothers. That's the power of the words that are on our doorposts. These are the words that are very deeply and irrevocably rooted in our Jewish bones. And they accompany us throughout our lifetime. The Rambam tells us that if you're serious, if you're serious about advancing your relationship with your Creator, the first thing you should focus on is to say the words of the Shema with great focus, devotion, and intention, and that should be a primary focus of yours for many years. For years, these words and these messages accompany us. And these words are so powerful that even the people who have reached the absolute pinnacle of our world are powerfully moved by them. The greatest giants of our history, the great Rabbi Akiva, the Talmud tells us, that during the Hadrianic persecutions, there was a prohibition against the public study of Torah. And Rabbi Akiva said, I'm going to study nonetheless. A Jew cannot survive without Torah, just like a fish cannot survive without water. I'm going to study. I'm going to teach. He was arrested. And he was brought to be executed. And as he is being executed in a horrific, macabre, heinous fashion, he was saying the Shema. And the students were puzzled. And they said to him, even now you could say the Shema? Even now you could comport yourself with such nobility? And he told them, every single day, when I said the Shema, I was hoping and waiting to have this opportunity to actualize the words of the Shema and to literally give up my life for God. And now I'm finally here. This is the moment I've been pining for and waiting for every single day. Now is the time to say the Shema. And as he finished the first sentence, his soul departed with the word Echad. When Rabbi Kiva, again, one of the greatest sages of our history, essentially the primary author of the Mishnah and the Talmud, really all of Torah, comes from Rabbi Akiva and his students. When he said these hallow words that we have on every one of our doorposts, he felt a groundswell, a surge of love of God. And he pined, he hoped, he yearned for the opportunity to actualize his love for his Creator by literally forfeiting his life for God. And when the opportunity came, Rabbi Akiva was ready. And indeed, he passed with the word Echad emanating from his lips. And we take these words and we affix them to our doorposts. And thereby, we bear testimony and we are witnesses that we too are part of this great and glorious nation. We too are connected to the unbroken chain of our glorious nation. It goes all the way back to our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their respective wives. Back to Moses, back to Aaron, back to the Exodus, back to the Sinai Revelation, back to King David, and King Solomon, and King Chistia, and to the giants of the Mishnah, to Hillel, to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, to Rabbi Tiva, to Rabbi Shun bar to Rabbi Judah the Prince to the authors of the Talmud. They all have the same as us, and we're all connected to them. To Abai and Rava, to 
Rabba and Rabbi Yosef, to Ravina and Ravashi, to Rashi and the Rambam, to the Arizal and Rabbi Yosef Cairo, or Cairo, to the Gaon of Vilna, to the Baal Shem Tov. All these giants and sages were part of our nation, and we are connected to them. We're part of this grand experiment called the Jewish people. And we symbolize that with our mezuzah. The mezuzah connects us to our family, to our community, to our illustrious antecedents, to our people. But most of all, it connects us with our Creator, with Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. All that is wrapped up in a scroll that we affix to our doorposts and we bear testimony to our fidelity, to our Creator, and to our people. We commit ourselves to this nation, come what may. And every day, we have an encounter with this realization dozens of times. We bind ourselves to our Creator. We bind ourselves to our people. And we bind ourselves to our national mission and destiny. Let's take this a step further. What are we supposed to feel when we pass the mezuzah? If we've been well trained, you know, you pass the mezuzah, you touch it, you ruminate a little bit, some have a tradition to kiss it. What is supposed to be going through our heads when we encounter the mezuzah? So the Talmud makes several powerful statements about the mezuzah and other associated mitzvos. And these ideas are going to help us round out our understanding of this wonderful mitzvah. The Talmud tells us in the book of Menachos on page 43b, Chavivin Yisrael, Israel, our nation, is beloved. We are cherished by God because God surrounded us with mitzvos. On our head, we have tefillin. On our arm, we have tefillin. On our clothing, we have tzitzis. And on our doorposts, we have the mezuzah. And regarding these themes, David said in Psalms, seven times I have praised you every single day. Why did David praise God seven times? For these seven things. But wait a minute. It's not seven. It's only three. It's filling. Well, maybe it's four. It's filling on your head. It's filling on your arm. Tzitzis. And mezuzah. That's, that's not seven. That's only four. So Rashi tells us the answer. It's filling on your head is one. It's filling on your arm is two. The four strings of the tzitzis is another four, which is six. And the mezuzah, which is seven. The Talmud is telling us something really interesting. We are cherished by God because he surrounded us with mitzvahs. We are enveloped with mitzvahs. We're in an environment of mitzvahs. And part of that is that our homes, our doorposts have mezuzahs upon them. Now, this is an idea about about the mezuzah, but it's also an idea about mitzvahs in general. We have so many mitzvahs in so many different areas of our life. And all of them are there to elevate us. Every part of our life is rendered sacred with a mitzvah. There is no area of life that's just mundane, bereft of holiness. We're beloved by God. He doesn't want us in a mundane environment. He wants us surrounded by mitzvahs. Wherever you go, you're surrounded. You're enveloped with mitzvahs. There's a midrash. Listen to this. The midrash says, there is nothing in the world that does not have an accompanying mitzvah. When you plow your ground, plow your field, 
seemingly something that every farmer does, right? There's a mitzvah. You cannot use an ox and a donkey together to plow. When you plant, there are laws of what you're allowed to plant where. When you harvest, there are certain things you have to leave for the poor people. When you need the bread, you got to give the challah to the coin. When you slaughter your animal, there are certain parts of the animal you got to give to the coin. Of course, there are all the laws of kosher and of dealing with fruits. And when you bury the dead, you can't make yourself bleed. You can't inflict an intentional wound in agony. And when you shave, you get a haircut. There's all these laws governing what you're allowed to cut and how you're allowed to cut it. You build a house. A lot of people build houses. You got to put a fence around the roof. You have to put a mezuzah on your door. You wear a garment, it's got to have tzitzis on it. Says the Midrash, every area of life, every behavior, every action should be replete with meaning. I always think of the sandwich. Who eats sandwiches? Everyone eats sandwiches. Unless they're gluten-free. Okay, so that's not a good example. Who eats steak? Everyone eats steak. Unless, unless they're vegetarian. But everyone eats, right? Everyone eats something. But what do we do when we eat? We make a blessing. We're elevating the experience that everyone does. Everyone does this. But for us, it's a mitzvah. For everyone else, they're just chomping grub. They're eating. For us, it's almost like we're bringing a sacrifice. We're connecting with our Creator. In every thing that we do, we're injecting meaning to it, purpose to it, substance to it. We all have homes. I guess maybe there are some people that are homeless. Most people have homes. We're installing God in our homes. And how do we do that? How do we elevate our homes? So it's not just a place where we live. It's a place where God's presence is felt. We do that with a mezuzah. I would argue that this is the reason why our sages tell us that if you are fastidious with the mitzvah of mezuzah, you will merit a beautiful home. Says the Talmud, Book of Shabbos, page 23b. Hazahir bin mezuzah. If someone is careful with the mezuzah, zoha ladira na. He merits a nice dwelling place. If you invest the effort to make God and his agenda part of your home, he says, I'm in. I'm like a, I'm like a co-owner of this domicile. I want to make it beautiful. Absent the mezuzah, it's just a house. It's just a home. But you're not going to have this divine blessing in your house. But there's more. The Talmud, after saying how the Jewish people are so cherished and beloved because we're surrounded by mitzvos. The Talmud adds, whoever has tefillin on their head and tefillin on their arms and tzitzis on their garments and a mezuzah on their door is strengthened from all sides against sin. And it quotes a verse in Ecclesiastes, Koheles, Vehachuta meshulash lo b'mehera yinatek. If there's a threefold cord, a string, it's not going to be quickly broken. And it quotes another verse. The angel of God surrounds those who are fearful of God and protects them and delivers them from sin. This brings us to another dimension of this mitzvah. The United States Department of Defense has what's called the nuclear triad. And that is we have nukes from submarines and nukes from land-based silos, and we have nukes that can be deployed from aircraft. The Jewish people, we also have a protective nuclear triad. We have three mitzvahs. Tefillin, tzitzis, and mezuzah. And they provide protection. Protection against blunders. We're discussing mezuzah today. And here we're told 
that this is a prophylactic against sin. There's some power inherent in this mitzvah. You take the scroll and you put it on your doorpost and it protects you against sin. Pretty cool. But why? Why is the mitzvah of mezuzah, why is the mezuzah a prophylactic sparing you from sin? I want you to listen very carefully to the answer. The Rambam, in the end of chapter 6 of the Laws of Mezuzah, says something incredible. This idea will not only enlighten us about Mezuzah, all of Torah, really all of life, will be viewed differently in the prism, or via the prism of this Rambam. He tells us, Chayev Adam Lehizar, a person should be very careful about the mezuzah, to do it right. Because it's obligatory to all at all times. And every time you enter, and every time you exit, you're going to encounter with the oneness of God. And you're going to remember the love of God. You recall that part of the text of the mezuzah is about the love of God. And it's going to wake you up from your slumber. And it's going to wake you up from the petty foolishness of the futility of time. And you're going to know that there's nothing that stands forever, only God. And right away when you pass the mezuzah, it's going to restore your senses. And it's going to make you walk in the proper, straight path of God. And he quotes the Talmud. If you have tefillin on your arm and tefillin on your head, and since it's on your garments and a mezuzah on your doorpost, you're not going to be very quick to sin. Why is that? Because they all serve as reminders. If you have lots of reminders, you're not going to make the mistake. And they're going to be like angels protecting you from sin. In the quotes of Talmud, the Almighty stations angels around those who fear him, and he saves them. This is a stunning idea. The Rambam calls these mitzvos reminders, signposts, angels that protect the person from sin. When you encounter the mezuzah, you're having a touch point, a meet up with the oneness of God. And it's going to wake you up from your spiritual slumber. He's telling us, We're asleep. We're asleep at the wheel in this world. God, after all, is is invisible to us. The spiritual ideas are just ideas. We cannot connect to the spiritual using our physical senses, which are the primary ways that we interface with the world. The Yetzirah controls us, and we obey this foreign God's commands with slavish dedication. Our soul is ignored. We're here on a mission, a critical mission, to get back to the eternal world of the soul. But we're sleeping. We're not aware of that. We're not living our life in recognition of that reality. Instead, we're caught up all the nonsense, all the trivialities of this passing world. It's a problem. We're at the wheel of this most critical mission, and we're sleeping. And the Almighty wants to save us. So he makes all these reminders, flashing reminders, signposts, milestones, mile markers. Wake up! Remember what you're here for. We forgot a mission. So the Torah gives us mitzvot to remind us about what we're here for, to wake us up from our existential slumber and to remember our mission. And that mission is inscribed on a scroll and literally placed upon our head and opposite our heart every day. And we take that mission statement and we place it upon every door so we don't forget what we are here for. Remember, remember, don't forget. 
Remember who you are. Remember that you have a soul. Remember what you're here to do. Remember what you must accomplish with your life. These constant reminders are designed to jar us away from our slumber, to batter through our reverie, to dump a bucket of ice upon our daydreaming self, to remind us what we're here for. This experience is transformative. It's almost a guarantee against sin. By definition, a sin is how someone behaves if they are asleep, if they have forgotten their mission. If you are asleep, you've forgotten your mission, all you're thinking about are the things that the eights are up places in front of you, the things that are trivial, that are ephemeral, that don't matter. When you wake up, you're not likely to make those mistakes. You would not cause yourself self-harm. You're not going to imperil your mission. It's so helpful. The Rambam says it's basically like an angel protecting you from making any mistakes. There's a really interesting observation that I heard from my grandfather, a blessed memory, on this comment in the Rambam. In his vast writings, there was one other place where he uses very similar verbiage, very similar terminology to describe a mitzvah. And that is in the Laws of Repentance, chapter 3, law number 4, when he's talking about the shofar. And he says, the shofar, the reason why we have the shofar, it's because God said so. But nevertheless, there's a message, there's a hint. The shofar is a wake-up call, saying, wake up, those who are asleep from your slumber. Examine your ways. Repent. Come back to God. Remember your Creator. These are the people who forget the truth with all the nonsense and all the trivialities of the time. And instead, they waste their whole life with all this nonsense that doesn't really matter. The chauffeur comes and says, wake up. An astute reader of the Rambam's explanation of both mezuzah and shofar you see that in both of them he uses this imagery of someone asleep and in need of a wake-up call and being distracted with trivial nonsense. The subtext of that is that the mezuzah is as powerful as the shofar. When you pass by a mezuzah and you encounter it and you stop and you pause and you reflect upon what it actually means, that can be as evocative as hearing those hallowed sounds of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. That is the power of the mezuzah. And now we know why. It is clearly protective against sin. Because if you're awake, you're not going to do any sins. But there's another layer of protection built into the mezuzah. There is an amazing Talmud about an individual named Unculus. Who is Unculus? Unculus is the author of the first and only authoritative and sanctioned translation of the Torah. And he was a convert. And he came from Roman aristocracy. His uncle was the Roman emperor. Which emperor? It's a dispute. Either Titus or Hadrian. Neither of them were passionate lovers of the Jewish people, and that's the understatement of the year. But uncle is converted, and he became one of the sages. Now, the Talmud tells us that Uncleus's uncle did not take his conversion to Judaism very kindly, and he sent a platoon of soldiers to go retrieve him. And the Talmud tells us, this is in the book of Avodah Zarah, page 11a, that his uncle sent a platoon of Roman soldiers to go retrieve him. And he started talking to them, 
and he showed them some verses in the Torah, and they were persuaded. They said, let us convert. Undeterred, the uncle sent a second cohort, and this time he gave him a warning. Don't talk to him. He's very persuasive. I don't want him converting you like he, he converted the other first group. So they grab him. They say, we're not talking. Ah, we're not talking. We're not, ah, I'm not talking. I'm not listening. Ah, oh, say, can you say? I'm not listening. And he's like, well, let me just tell you one thing. I say, oh, one thing. How persuasive could it be? Okay, one thing we'll let you say. And he tells them, the way it works in your world is that a minor official holds a torch, illuminates the way of the more important official. If you have a duke and a governor, the common official holds the light before them. But what about when there's the ruler of a whole precinct, a king, who holds the torch for that? Well, then, then the duke or the governor holds it for the person who's even higher. By us, it's the opposite. God holds the torch for the common folk, for the people. And he quotes the verse, God was going before the Jewish nation with a pillar of fire. When the second group of soldiers heard that God illuminates the path for the Jewish people, they were convinced and they too converted. The uncle, again, when the second group didn't show up, he figured out what happened and he warns the third group, not even a single word. He is so persuasive. Don't say a single word to him. Don't let him say anything. They grab him. They start hauling him outside. And he stops to touch the mezuzah. And they're intrigued. And he says to them, do you know what this is? And they say, no, you tell us what it is. So he says, I'll tell you what this is. You see this mezuzah at the outside of our house? In the rest of the world, the king is inside the palace. And the soldiers, the sentinels, the sentries are outside guarding the king. But God doesn't work like that. We are inside the house. We're inside the castle. We're inside the palace. And God is outside, represented by the mezuzah, patrolling guarding, protecting, preserving us who are inside. And that's the mezuzah. And they heard that, and they too converted. And Uncle Emperor gave up. This is an amazing story. We have Unculus, the nephew of the Roman Emperor. He converts, and he successfully converts three successive platoons of hardened Roman legionaries who are trying to arrest him. And for the third group, the mezuzah was what persuaded them. Specifically this idea that God is outside of our house protecting us. He protects his subjects, unlike human kings who have their subjects protect them. This is revealing to us another layer of the mezuzah. The mezuzah, of course, provides spiritual protection against sin, but physically it also provides protection. Our sages tell us, if you are careful with the mitzvah of mezuzah, you will merit long life both for you and your children. On the flip side, this is very scary. The Talmud of the book of Shabbos, page 32a, tells us that there's at least one opinion that says that premature death of children is due to negligence in the mitzvah of mezuzah. If you don't have the protection, you are vulnerable. So this is another angle of the mitzvah of mezuzah. And by the way, that's why it's outside. It's outside the house. When we are inside the house... Maybe we're a bit vulnerable. Maybe we're asleep. We're exposed to attack. There are forces 
both natural and supernatural, trying to infiltrate, trying to cause damage. And God, so to speak, is outside patrolling, patrolling the perimeter of the house, making sure that no danger enters. And by the way, the protection is multi-layered. The Zohar tells us that if someone has a door protected by the mezuzah, no demon can enter. The Satan can't enter. No harmful influences can enter. Because God is protecting that entrance. And even when there is terror that is unleashed, and there is a destroying angel wreaking havoc all around, when he wants to enter the house, he sees the name of God, and he gets frozen in his tracks. And therefore, a person has to always make sure that mezuzah to merit that protection. And the commentaries find precedent for the mezuzah providing hermetic protection for those in the house from the episode of the Exodus from Egypt. When God swept through Egypt, killing every firstborn, the Jewish homes that had the blood of the pastoral sacrifice, where the mezuzah is, they were spared. That was the degree of protection that was granted to the nation in Egypt. With your mezuzah, Aristides tell us, you are afforded an even higher degree of protection. In the name of the mezuzah, you should write it, al mezuzos pesecha. It says the word zuz maves, banish death, go away death. When Uncleus told those Romans about the tremendous protection that the mezuzah affords to us, they were persuaded. They were persuaded to give up everything like he did, and to enter into God's loving embrace. And of course, we can now see how persuasive it actually is. But there's also a deeper Kabbalistic understanding of Unculus's argument about the mezuzah. Unculus became a convert, and the Roman emperor sent three successive groups of Roman soldiers to retrieve his nephew. And to the first group, he persuaded them with verses, unnamed verses in the Talmud. The second group, they were persuaded by the fact that God holds the candle, holds the fire outside for his people. And the third group were persuaded with the mezuzah. And when we read it simply, we think, well... I don't know, if I was a Roman, would I give up everything because Uncle has said this to me? Doesn't sound so life-altering. But what does it actually mean? What is the secret here? There is a deeper dimension in this story that relates to the most esoteric ideas that we know of. What does it mean? that God holds the fire outside? What does it mean that God protects the perimeter and we're inside the palace? We know that God created all of existence. Before creation, God existed, nothing else did. That world is known in the esoteric arcane literature the Kabbalistic literature, as an infinite light. An infinite light. The Or Ein Sof, the infinite light. And when God created existence outside of him, where was there room for creation? God, so to speak, minimized himself and carved out a place for existence Outside of God. This is the beginning of the Kabbalistic literature. 
we're surrounded by this infinite light. The Jewish people were surrounded by God's light. The Kabbalistic reading of what Uncles was telling his Roman visitors was that God designed the world that the infinite light is outside and inside. Well, that's us. What this reveals to us, and again, it's a very advanced idea. The Almighty, so to speak, moved aside and placed us, mortal, fallible humans, at the epicenter of existence. And he ceded control to us. Who's in the palace? Who is calling the shots? Who is pulling and pushing the levers? Humans. He's holding the light on the outside. The infinite light is on the outside. But in the palace, that's us. Meaning that the fate of all of creation is in our hands. Our decisions will determine everything. We are at the center of the universe. We effectuate what happens in the world. The mind, of course, has all the power. But he, so to speak, moved aside and he yielded to us and placed us in the middle. Our actions, our words, our deeds, our thoughts, they are the determinants of what happens in the world. In the literature, man is called a small world. The world is called a big man. What that means is that in the very center of it all, in that one point, in the very center of all of this existence that God created, is the small world called man. And this is really what determines everything that happens to all of the creation outside of that. This is a, an amazing, groundbreaking, life-changing insight. We believe, of course, in free will. But this is free will on steroids. It's not just that we have choices We have the keys to the kingdom. We are in the palace. The Almighty, so to speak, forfeited the running of the world to us. When the Romans understood the power of what a human can become, this incredible understanding of the worldview that we have, they said, we want in. We want to be part of this nation that knows what to do inside that palace. That God, so to speak, gave the tools, gave the instructions for how to manage this madness, how to manage this kingdom. We're on the inside. We're in the HQ with the Almighty and His infinite light around us. That is the symbolism of the mezuzah. And that is why it was so enchantingly persuasive to those hardened Roman soldiers. The Almighty is protecting us, so to speak, from the outside. He's handing us the power, the tools, and it's our mission to exercise that power. We are in control of this whole lumbering world. That is the Kabbalistic structure of existence. It's a very deep idea. And the mezuzah, the mezuzah reminds us of the paramount importance of us and our choices. We see it. We remember that we are on the inside of the palace We have an incredible role to play in existence. Every time you pass by mezuzah, 
Every time uncle has passed by mezuzah, what would he think? He would remember that he's on the inside. God's on the outside. God ceded control to you. What are you going to do with it? Every choice that you make ripples throughout all of existence, cascades throughout all the worlds, all the dimensions. We're in the center. We're in those palace states. God's on the outside. We're on the inside. We hold the reins to determine the trajectory of all of humanity and all of history, the destiny of the world. Every time we pass this, we're reminded, is in our hands. I want to finish with one observation. There are, as we know, 613 mitzvahs. Some of them, of course, absent the temple, absent other factors, we cannot fulfill. The ones that we can fulfill are codified. The laws of how to do it are codified in a book of Jewish law called the Shulchan Aruch, the authoritative code of Jewish law. It's divided up into four sections, Arachaim, Yoradea, Evan Ezer, Choshe Mishpat, each comprised of hundreds of chapters. And there is exactly one chapter dedicated to the reward of a mitzvah. And that is chapter 285 in Yoridea, titled, Schar Mitzvah's Mezuzah, the reward of the mitzvah of mezuzah. And now we know why this mitzvah has so much reward. And we know why there is such profound meaning and power in this mitzvah. And thus begins our deep dive into mezuzah. Of course, there is so much still to cover. How do you write a mezuzah? How do you affix a mezuzah? What kind of rooms need a mezuzah? How do I know if a mezuzah conforms to the requirements of a halachically valid mezuzah? But we have to leave something to next time. If you enjoyed this deep dive, send me an email, rabbiwalbeijima.com. It is a delight to study the laws and the ideas and the dimensions and the insights of the mezuzah from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. I thank you for your time and your attention and your wonderful listenership.